Here we go. The Lord is my shepherd, everybody. The Lord is my shepherd. He goes before me. He goes before me. Defender behind me. Defender behind me. I won't fear. I won't fear. Filled with anointing. I'm filled with anointing. Thank you, Jesus. My cup's overflowing. My cup's overflowing. No weapon can harm me. No weapon can harm me. Jesus. I won't fear. Shout Jesus right there. He always guides me. He always guides me. <laughs> Through mountains and valleys. Mountains and valleys. <laughs> His joy is refreshing. His joy is Good morning. My name is Brad. If you're new or visiting, thankful that you're here today. Um, I don't know about you, uh, but I sometimes struggle with a, a lot of anxiousness. Anybody here struggle with anxiousness about anything? And uh, 
the Lord's been teaching me this week, and there, there's some really well-known passages that you can go to if you're struggling with anxiety. There's just ones that we just know, like Matthew chapter 6, right? Don't worry, don't worry, don't worry, don't be anxious, right? And, and, but for those people who do struggle with anxiety, you can say don't worry all you want, but guess what happens an hour later, 10 minutes later, right? It seems to creep back in. And so what's, what's the answer for that? And so uh, this is my sermon before the sermon, and I want to encourage you with this this morning because it's so true, and I found it to be true in my life, uh, especially this week. We know in Matthew 27, or 6, 27, it says, And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his lifespan? It's so true. Which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his lifespan? And why are you anxious? And it goes on to uh, describe things like clothing and what we'll eat. But then he says this in verse 33. This is Jesus speaking. He says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Seek, right? Seek, that means something that's ahead. That's not worrying about yesterday or last week or last month. Seeking is about thinking about what's ahead and thinking about what God has in store. Seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, right? And that's why we're here today, because we enjoy the righteousness that we've been given through Jesus Christ. We're going to gather around the communion table today. Seek first His kingdom and His righteousness and all these things, it says, will be added to you. And so today as we're gathered together, I want us to seek His kingdom here this morning and His righteousness and everything else after that will be added to us. And so let's go ahead and stand. Father, we are thankful to be here together, to gather in your name, to lift up our voices in worship, to seek after you, to seek after your kingdom, your kingdom come, your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven, Father, and so I pray that you would turn our hearts and our attention, those who are here, if we have anyone here this morning that's anxious and thinking about things from yesterday or thinking about things that are distracting, that that we would now be able to set our hearts and our minds on you and your kingdom and your righteousness and what you've done. And so, Father, lead us now as we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.
This is a portion of Isaiah 40 that I've been reading a lot this week and I wanted to share it with you this morning. Who else has held the oceans in his hand? Who has measured off the heavens with his fingers? Who else knows the weight of the earth or has weighed the mountains and hills on a scale? Who is able to advise the spirit of the Lord? Who knows enough to give him advice or teach him? Has the Lord ever needed anyone's advice? Does he need instruction about what is good? Did someone teach him what is right or show him the path of justice? No, for all the nations of the world are but a drop in the bucket. They are nothing more than dust on the scales. He picks up the whole earth as though it were a grain of sand. All the wood in Lebanon's forests and all of Lebanon's animals would not be enough to make a burnt offering worthy of our God. The nations of the world are worth nothing to him. In the eyes, they count for less than nothing, mere emptiness and froth. To whom can you compare God? What image can you find to resemble him? Can he be compared to an idol formed in a mold, overlaid with gold, decorated with silver chains? Or if people are too poor for that, they might at least choose wood that won't decay and a skilled craftsman to carve an image that won't fall down. Haven't you heard? Don't you understand? Are you deaf to the words of God, the words he gave before the world began? Are you so ignorant? God sits above the circle of the earth. The people below seem like grasshoppers to him. He spreads out the heavens like a curtain and makes his tent from them. He judges the great people of the world and brings them all to nothing. They hardly get started, barely taking root. When he blows on them and they wither, the wind carries them off like a chaff. To whom will you compare me? Who is my equal? Asked the Holy One. Look up into the heavens. Who created all the stars? He brings them out like an army, one after another, calling each by its name. Because of his great power and incomparable strength, not a single one is missing. O oh, Jacob, how can you say the Lord does not see your troubles? Israel, how can you say God ignores your rights? Have you heard? Have you never understood? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of all the earth. He never grows weak or weary. No one can measure the depths of his understanding. He gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. Even youths will become weak and tired and young men will fall in exhaustion. But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary and they will walk and not faint. Father to the fatherless, defender of the weak, freedom for the prisoner.
with you.
thank you for the confidence that we can have in you because of the strength that is unfailing when we grow weary and tired you don't and help us to lean into you and to trust you to find our strength and confidence and to only draw that from you amen you can be seated Good morning, everyone. Kids, you are released to your classes. We have just a couple quick announcements this morning. Um, we've talked about some popsicles for the past few Sundays. So popsicles at the park this Tuesday, May 24th, is the first one. Rotary Park, 6 p.m. Remember, that was all ages. So if you love popsicles and playing at the park, come check that out and be there um, and have a good time with that. Um, special announcement for Senior High Youth Group. If you have your glow-in-the-dark putt-putt at Gehanna, 6.45 today. That's $8 for the putt-putt, extra ice cream, extra money for however much ice cream you want to eat. 
um, be ready for that. So, and then the rest of this summer, senior high school uh, youth group will have different drop-in dates each month, so we'll pay attention to those as we come up. As we kind of mentioned last week, our junior high youth group's taking a little pause for the summer, and then we'll uh, regroup with both groups back um, in the fall, and we'll come together and talk about what that's going to look like and kind of revamp and kick things back off in the fall. With youth group in mind, Jim and Michelle, do you mind coming up here? They do, but they're going to anyway, so. Wherever you want to go is fine. I'll, that's good. So Jim and Michelle, if you don't know, um, have been our youth group leaders for the junior high youth group. I'm thinking seven years, is that correct? So the past seven years, they've uh, uh, been diligent and hardworking and taking care of our junior high youth group. So we want to recognize them for their hard service. And I was thinking about it this morning. Um, I think it was about a year ago, maybe the beginning of this school year, uh, they kind of announced their farewell tour, maybe just behind the scenes. So people might not have really known that, but uh, this has kind of been their farewell tour coming up to this summer break. Um, but I was thinking about that this morning, and I was, I know Jim's a baseball fan, and it's not Cleveland Indi Indian history, but I was thinking this morning about uh, um, Cal Ripken Jr. If you know Cal Ripken Jr., he had like the record for like the Iron Man. He started the most games in, in baseball history. Jim might know the number, I don't know. No, not for sure, but it was a lot, right? So I, was, I remember watching like his last game as he was retiring, he was wrapping up his farewell tour, and I remember him taking this tour around the whole stadium, I think Baltimore's where he played, he was slapping fives, shaking hands with the whole, whole crowd all the way around to start that, uh, to start that game after his, he was going to come, come to retirement and not play the next game, it was kind of the end of things, and I was thinking, that's the Iron Man, right? Well, here's Jim and Michelle, seven years. Cal Ripon's got nothing on them because he wasn't dealing with middle school kids, if you know what I mean. So if you want to talk about an Iron Man award and, and woman award, uh, we want to recognize them for their service. So um, what an awesome thing, a blessing that they've had uh, and the kids that they've touched and, and served and given uh, great lessons to over the years. So if you would, just give a round of applause for these two. And don't leave yet. And I ha we have a gift from our, from our leadership, from our congregation for you guys, a card and a small little gift in there um, that we just want to say thank you for your years of service. What an awesome blessing it is that we have this. I'll get to do it in a second because I'm going to pray for us right now. So if you want to join me in prayer. Father, we thank you for uh, people like Jim and Michelle who are willing to just volunteer and serve and share your truth um, with others. And whether it's the kids upstairs in NRK, whether it's the junior high youth group, the high school youth group, Lord, it's Brad's preaching, it's, it's our leadership team, worship team up here singing and lifting voices to you, Lord. Uh, we thank you for the people who have hearts to share your truth with others, Lord. Um, and we pray that you would just bless Jim and Michelle, bless, bless those other ones who are serving you uh, diligently and, and, and trying to get your word to others so that others may know your love and know your truth. And, and be rescued from this dark world that we live in and brought back to peace and unity with you, Lord. We thank you and praise you for that. Um, it's in God's name I pray. Amen.
Give me one magnificent obsession. Give me one glorious ambition for my life to know and follow hard after you. To know and follow hard after you. To grow as your disciple. Hey, Becky, can we do that song at the end? All right, if you have a Bible and you'd like to open it up to John chapter 8, that's where we're going to be today, in John chapter 8, and uh, we're going to start in verse 12, and if you've been tracking along with me, you'd say, well, wait a minute, we're going to miss a spot. We might even miss one of my favorite stories in all of Scripture when it comes to uh, the character and, and love and grace and mercy of Jesus Christ, and so I just want to give you a little, just quick snippet on why we're going to skip over that, that it really matters, but uh, if you look closely in your Bible, there's a little italicized place there, and it says that the earliest manuscripts um, do not include uh, John chapter 7, uh, verse, I think, 53 through 811. And, and so uh, I'm, not, I'm not a Bible scholar, I'm a Bible teacher. And so I teach the Word. Uh, some, a lot of scholars have believed that it's not included in the earliest manuscripts. Um, it's in God's Word. I've enjoyed reading it. I've enjoyed studying it. Um, I've probably taught it on occasion. But uh, this morning... I, I feel compelled as a teacher of God's Word is that I teach, you know, one of my goals in life is to boldly proclaim the Word of God without apology. And so uh, I want to be able to do that boldly and without apology, and so I want to know for sure this is in, this is in, this is in, it's out, it's in, it's out, so I want to know if it's in. And so the passage there in, in John 53, I'm not saying it didn't happen. I'm not saying it's not worth reading. It totally is. It says a lot about the nature and the character of Jesus Christ. Study it on your own. Um, look into it. If you really want to hear uh, someone, uh, you know, look up a good pastor online. I like John, or uh, I like uh, Alistair Begg. Listen to his sermon on, on uh, John 1, or 8, 1 through 11. You'll be blessed. Uh, but this morning, I want to focus on one verse from John chapter 8, beginning in verse 12. And so if you want to turn there, I'll pray for us. Father, we are thankful for your word. Thankful for what it says about you. We're thankful for uh, how you communicate to us. I pray that you would open our eyes and, and give us a, a, a greater picture of who you are, that we would have a greater confidence in you based on what we read and what we know and how we choose to follow. And so stir our hearts now with thankfulness and gratitude because of who you are and what your word says about you. And we trust this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm just going to cover one verse today and it's, it's Jesus making another one of these I am statements. There's a lot of things in life that make a statement, right? My uh, son who graduated recently, uh, he went to prom a few weeks back with some of his buddies and we went over and he was a part of the prom court and so we went over to take pictures and I was interested in watching some of the kids showing up for prom because it was very apparent that some of them were there to make a statement, right? All red suit, top to bottom, 
you know, all the different ways that we can make statements. And Jesus, on multiple occasions, went out of his way, calculating specific timing to make a statement. And in this case, another case, Jesus specifically measures his words, measures the moment, the right time, the right words to make a statement. And in this statement, he makes three statements in one. Three statements in one that are so important for all people to hear. So I pray that you this morning, I pray that you might share this with someone else. But here's one statement made by Jesus Christ where he makes three life-changing statements for all to hear. John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus says again, Jesus spoke. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus says, I am the world, or I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. In this first part, he makes a statement about his exclusivity. I am. I am. What? The light. The light. How many lights are in here? I'm counting. One, two, three, four, five. I mean, there's a number of lights in this building. We have lights in our houses. We have lights in our cars. We have, I'm fascinated with little tiny flashlights that are super bright. And you do all these. That we have no shortage of lights. But Jesus claims with exclusivity that he is the light of the world. The light of the world. No one but him. And in saying that... In saying that, he's saying something even greater than just being a light. He's saying he's the light of the world, which means all things revolve around me. See, there's, I'll give you some context to why Jesus said this. Just like we talked about a few weeks ago when Jesus was saying that he is a water. Where he says, I am the bread of life. Throughout the Old Testament, the people of Israel, they had to be taken care of while they were wandering through the wilderness... By God, and he took care of them by providing bread, he took care of them by providing water, he took care of them by providing for them a way in which they can follow. And so he led them by day by a pillar of clouds, and he led them by night by a pillar of fire. And so people were able to follow after him, and so we remembered we're now during this time of the Feast of Tabernacles, Festival of Booths, people are celebrating, it's a big time in Jerusalem, people are all gathered there from all around, and this portion of Jesus' teaching takes place, it says later on, you'll read, and, and I think Clint's going to cover this uh, part maybe next week, but uh, you'll read, it says, and he taught these things in the treasury. The treasury also would be known as the court of women. This was a place where people would gather, and during this specific time, there were lamps, big bowls that were attached to the walls of the temple. And at nighttime, they would come in and they would light these bowls. And that during this time of the Feast of Tabernacles, there would be a celebration. There would be music and dancing and singing. Because they were remembering God's leadership to them while they were in the wilderness by light. And so at this time, in the treasury, in the temple or the court of women, they're lighting these lights. And Jesus stands forth and he says, at the perfect time, what? I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. If you're looking for a light to guide you, I'm it. If you're looking for a light to lead you, if you're looking for a light for hope, how many of you have been just trapped in the darkness before? You're looking, searching for some kind of light. I've got children now who are, who are old enough to to graduate, but also kids who are still young enough that they want the hallway light on at night. Why is that? Because light brings comfort. Light brings us comfort. And Jesus says, I am the comfort of the world. I am the light of the world. I am the leadership of the world. It's me. So making these I am statements didn't make him very many friends with a lot of the Jewish leadership, because when he used these words like I am, it put him in a different category. He was no longer speaking to them as if he was just another teacher. 
But he was saying that he was one in himself with the Father. Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world, the source. Anybody here like to see stars? I love to look up and, and see the stars. And, and um, the best place to see the stars is where there's a, lo- there's a lot less what they call light pollution. All right? You got to get out in the country. You can't see the stars very well uh, from the top of a, of a building in Chicago. You can't see the stars very well in your neighborhood when everybody's got their back light lights on, back porch lights on. You've got to get out where there's no light pollution. And when you get in a place like that and you look up, it's astounding, isn't it? I know for me, when I get in a place like that and I look up, it just stirs my heart to worship. When you see not just the stars, but you begin to see the layers of stars and the movement of what's going on in in space. And how much greater is it for us when we see Jesus Christ as the light of the world and we put away all the other competing voices and opinions and thoughts and ideas and we see him for who he really is and all of the light pollution goes away and we see him as being the light, the singular light of the world. It brings us so much comfort. Like I was reading this morning, sometimes I get anxious, sometimes I worry about things. Seek first the kingdom of heaven. Put your eyes on him alone. Shut down all of the other competing ideas and and worries. And when you see him for who he really is and he shines that brightly, it brings us comfort. So here's Jesus standing amongst all of these people saying, I am the light of the world. I am the light. Exclusivity. He's the source. All things move around him. He is the source for who? I am the light of what? The world. I am the light of the world. I know sometimes it's frowned on to have a monopoly, right? People don't like that. Someone owns all the stores in town. They own everything in town. People don't like it. But Jesus Christ has a monopoly on hope. There's no place else. There's no other thing that you can look to. There's no other source of comfort. There's no other hope for salvation. There's no other hope for anything outside of the things that fade in this world that comes from something other than Christ. He has a monopoly on all, for all people. For I am the light of the world. Not just the light of the church. Not just the light of my small group. Jesus Christ is the light of the world gives so much hope what a great message for Jesus to stand and say I am the light of the world that's the first part of this statement the second part is a great promise he says whoever follows me will not walk in darkness whoever follows me again Jesus spoke to them saying I am the light of the world Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness. Whoever follows me. Imagine an invitation from God himself to say, follow me. We see it all throughout the Gospels. Jesus inviting people to follow him. Follow him. This is what we want to do. God's called us to be ministers of reconciliation. Calling people to come back to God and follow after him. Because we know God's way is the best way. It may not be broad, there may not be a lot of people on it, it may be a narrow road, and few may find it, but that's where God is, and if we follow after him, the promise is what? For those who follow after me, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness. Darkness is a problem. Darkness is a serious problem in the world that we live in. Like I said, all you have to do is, I've said this over and over, you turn on the news, you see all the things that are happening in the world. There is no shortness of darkness all around us. See the notifications of even just dark things, even within our own community. I was studying this the other day when up on the scanner comes a, 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 
a, um, a call for a shooting, multiple shootings within our own community. Just this past week, darkness. And it's not just darkness around us, it's darkness within us. How many of you struggle with your thoughts? Darkness is what? An absence of light. And where there's an absence of light, specifically the kind of light that Jesus is talking about, there's an absence of truth. And when we walk in darkness without truth, we will stumble and fall and there will be much pain. Those who follow me will not walk in darkness. What a great promise. We walk in the darkness of this world. We walk in the darkness of our souls. We walk in the darkness of our thought processes and and the patterns of our thinking. But God makes this great promise that if you don't want to be in darkness, what do you do? You follow him. Well, that takes a couple things. We talk about these things all the time. And, And if you think what I'm saying is redundant, Imagine Jesus Christ just repackaging the same message in different places and different times for different people, and he's saying the same thing. Follow me. Follow me requires a couple things. Follow me requires faith, right? We're willing to follow him. If you don't want to be in darkness, this is why I love 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There's no temptation that's not common to man. There's no temptation that's not common to man, but... God in his grace and his mercy, he always gives us a way of escape. If we choose to follow him, out of it. There's no temptation that's not common to man. Any kind of dark thought that you're having, any kind of temptation that you're having, any kind of dark idea or place that you're in, God always gives us a way of escape. But it starts with faith. You have to believe that God will lead me out of this. God will lead me out of this. Follow takes faith, but it also takes obedience, right? Say, follow me. Okay. My, my eight-year-old and I, we've got this thing where he follows after me, right? And he lags behind sometimes. You know what I'm talking about? You know where I'm going with this? And he gets behind me, and I turn around and I say two words to him. What do I say? You coming? Right? You coming? And sometimes he can get pretty far away. And God, when he leads us, you, you, you can't be led and not go. It's impossible. You can't be led and not go. And so for a lot of us, we struggle in our spiritual lives and we're living in darkness. Jesus is trying to lead us and he's looking behind. He's saying, you coming? You want out of the darkness? Well, let's go. I will lead you. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness. But so often, whatever it is, we want to just sit down in the dark. And when we sit in the dark, what's in the dark? Absence of truth. Absence of light. And that's when Satan, he loves to Manipulate your mind, manipulate your heart, tell you lies, keep you in the dark. And all the while, Jesus is saying, you coming? You coming? For whoever follows me will not walk in darkness. This is a great promise, just like uh, the promise that we have about the Spirit. For those who walk according to the Spirit, you will not gratify the desires of your flesh. If you do this, you will not do that. If you follow me, you will not walk in darkness. Is there any excuse for any of us who put our faith in Jesus Christ and choose to obey him? Is there any reason for any of us to be in the dark? None. But how many of you have been in the dark in the past week? A lot of us. This is a great promise, not just for the people then, not just for people who don't believe, but for all of us, a great promise. I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness. I know there's been a lot of times 
I can think specifically of times when I thought, I'm, I'm driving, it's dark, it's raining, I can't see anything. But what I can see ahead of me is some taillights. I'm like, if I can just keep my focus on these taillights, I'll be okay. Anybody have that experience before? But you, you better really hope and pray that those taillights <laughs> stay on the road. And we can say with full assurance and confidence that if we keep our eyes on the light which is Jesus Christ, that he will not lead us astray. Come to me. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness. But I think this is one of the greatest parts of the promise. But will have the light of light. But will have the light of light. This isn't just saying that whoever follows after me will not walk in darkness. This is even greater. That he, kept, he keeps escalating what he's saying. I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows after me will not walk in darkness. But what? Will have. Will possess. What a promise. For those who follow after Jesus, not only will they not walk in darkness, but they will have for themselves the light of life. They will have for themselves the light of life. Well, where does that come from? You know, I walk around all the time and I look at people and I think, I wonder if they even consider the fact that they need Jesus Christ. Sometimes I think about preaching to our church and I think, I wonder if people really understand just how important it is that we have Christ, that we have him, that we are in him and he is in us. The light of life. Remember in John 1, it says, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. But what's it talk about? It says darkness. It says in, in John 1 that people love the darkness. And instead of choosing, instead of choosing to follow after Christ by faith and receive this light of life that goes within us, we choose darkness instead. And if we could just understand what it feels like to have the light. What does it feel like? Do you know what it feels like to have the light? You know what it feels like to have the light? He's in me. You know what it feels like to have the light? It's life-changing life-changing. It's life-giving. When you have the light, you, you want to share it. You emphasize it. I got a, I got a little, I was telling you before, I, I like lights. And someone had given me a, a $25 gift card to Cabela's for Christmas. And I'm like, what am I going to get with this $25 gift card? And I'm looking around the whole store. I had some time one day. Tracy was off doing something else, and I'm like, I'm just going to mill around this store for a while with the kids, and they can look at the animals, and I'm going to find something for 25 bucks that I can't live without. And I found this flashlight. It's blinding bright. It doesn't even take batteries. You can plug it into your computer. It, it's small. It's got a little clip on it. You can clip it on your hat. The, the, the top of it, if you rotate it, it turns the head of it to a 90 degree. And you know what's even greater than all that? It's got a magnet on the end of it. So if you're working on your car or whatever, you can stick it to your fender and work. It's amazing. I show it to everybody. Remember? My boys, I'm like, check this out. They're like, all you, all you want to talk about is your little light. Imagine having the light of the world. Imagine having the light of the world in all of the different. That's why I was saying, we're talking about the light of life. All of the different applications for this light. Marital problems, I've got something for you. The light of the world. Problems with anxiety, I've got something for you. It's the light of the world. Imagine. The possibilities. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. 
Whoever follows after me will not walk in darkness, but will have, will possess. You have it, the light of life. You enjoy it. Do you have certain lights in your house or certain things? There's, there's a thing now that the kids, all the kids are talking about. It's called the aesthetic. You know what I'm talking about? It's all about the aesthetic. And lights really change the aesthetic, right? The way something's lit. You enjoy it. You just like to look at the way that it's lit up. You like the way that light changes our appearance. Light changes our countenance. And I can tell you, those of you who are married, when you look into the eyes and the heart of your partner, your husband or wife, and you can tell by their countenance whether or not they're walking by the light. Right? My wife knows. She looked at me the other day. She's like, you are not walking in the Spirit. Maybe you're right. <laughs> you can tell. There's, 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 there's a sense when, when the light of life is present, it changes our aesthetic. There's nothing, there's no filter in the world that's better than the light of the world. And like I said, you want to offer your light to others, right? If I have my trusty $25 flashlight in my pocket and I walk by a dude in the parking lot in the dark and he's fumbling for lug nuts, I must not really think my light is as special as I think it is at home if I'm not willing to stop and say, hey, check this out. I see you've got a problem here. Watch this. Wow. This is really cool. Thank you. Now I'm able to do what I need to do here. We want to share it. We want to share our light. You know the song when you're kids, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Except for it's not that little. the light of the world and it's a treasure it's been given to you the light of life I love the way scripture ties things together for us because there's a lot of people like you know what it's like you know what it's like to have the light of life in you Paul knew what it was like to have the light of life in 2 Corinthians Chapter 4, he says this, For God who said, let your light shine out of the darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. He has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. He says, but we have this treasure, speaking of the light, we have this treasure in jars of clay. To show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not us. We are weak, prone to darkness, broken people. But for those who see Jesus Christ as the light of the world and choose to walk after him, he has illuminated your life and within you shines out the life, light of life like a lamp inside of a broken piece of pottery. And what that light does is it shines out and proves the glory of God. It proves that he's glorious. There's nothing good about myself. I, like Paul, would say like a broken piece of pottery, like a jar of clay with all kinds of imperfections and voids. But the treasure is what God has put inside of me. And what's good about me is a testimony to his goodness alone. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Do you want the light? 
Do you have that light? Do you possess the light? If not, I would, I would simply invite you to just, just pray a prayer of repentance. Father, I've walked in the darkness on my own stubbornly. And I see you. I see Christ that's the light of the world. And I, I, I want to follow after you. I'm sorry for my sins. Father, forgive me. And I want to walk after your son. And he will lead you. And he will give you the light of life. I promise you. We're going to join around the communion table now. Uh, and, and I love when we're able to celebrate communion as a, rep, as a remembrance of what Christ has done for us. That none of us have any righteousness of our own. All righteousness that we have comes through what Christ has done for us. And we remember that as we gather around his table. Remember the body of blood broken for us. The blood of Christ um, poured out for the sake of our sins. And that when we put our faith in him, that he gives us his righteousness, he fills us with his spirit, he gives us the light of life. If you're not a believer and follower of Jesus Christ, um, I would invite you to... to, uh, just remain seated. We, we care for you. We love you. We're glad that you're here. Uh, but it, it, this is not just an empty ritual that we do because it's the Sunday that we take communion. Uh, we do this out of great uh, uh, reverence for what Christ has done for us and what we believe, the body of Christ broken for us, the blood of Christ spilled out for us. So, um, But if this morning God is speaking to you and you want to put your faith in him, this may be the first time you're invited to come by faith, to the table, and with a physical representation of saying, I put my faith in the broken body of Jesus Christ and his blood to cover my sins and make me new. You can make that choice by faith today and simply come forward. And so let me pray for us, and you can come down uh, each aisle here and then go around the outside to return to your seats, and then uh, you can keep a hold of the the bread and the cup, and we'll take it all together uh, when we've all been served. So. Father, we love you. We want you to be honored. So give us faith to trust and follow after you. And fill us with your light, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.
I often reference, you know, just God's goodness and how he teaches us. You know, it's very plain about what he's trying to communicate. I am the light of the world. He said, I am the bread of life. When he taught his disciples to remember him during the Passover, he used these physical things that we can put our hands on, we can taste and we can feel and we, it can be real to us. And so if you want to stand, I want to pray over us. Father, we come in remembrance of your son, his sacrifice for us. He lived a life of love and sacrifice, service, thinking even at the time that this took place, he was washing the feet of his disciples. He willingly gave himself up for our sins. And so we remember the broken body for our forgiveness and our righteousness. The body of Christ broken for you. Father, we're thankful for your provision for our sins, that you know that we cannot be together because of the separation between us due to our sins, and so you didn't want that. You made a provision for us through the sacrifice of your Son and his blood to cover our sins, to wash us, as your word says, white as snow, you wash us clean, and we come before you without a, 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 a stain of sin through the blood of your son Jesus Christ and so the blood of Christ broken for you that washes away all of your sin to sing Give Me One Pure and Holy Passion.
The way out of darkness comes by faith and obedience and following after the light of the world. To know and follow hard after you. And so I pray as you leave uh, this week, you might hear the voice of your Father saying, You coming? To know that you're loved, we'll see you next time.